magnetize your minis, flight stands, custom kits, and all the hobby supplies you'll need from the magnetbaron.com. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for CraftWorldEldar.com. I'm Brent and this is part three of my 10th edition Eldari Index Review. In part three, I will be talking about Harlequins, Yanari, Corsairs, in that order, and then finally Wind Riders because I forgot them when I was talking about Guardians last time. Sorry, Wind Riders, uh, you have a lot of uses. But we're starting with Harlequins. Harlequins have changed it in a big way in 10th edition. I talked about this a little bit in part one when I was doing the overview. Uh, Harlequins are not really a standalone faction anymore. And it isn't just that they all have the Eldari keyword now and it's been simplified so Craft World's players can use Harlequins like they could back in second and third ed. But it feels, in fact, like Harlequins are not really meant to be a standalone faction. Instead, they are this quirky bag of tricks that a Craft World player can reach into for very particular tools. And there are some very good tools in that bag, but I think I have to start simply by expressing some sympathy for Harlequin players. In that first video, I said that because you don't get any special benefit the way things are right now for limiting yourself to the Harlequin's data sheets, you're at an inherent disadvantage for the simple reason that there are 60 data sheets in the Eldari Codex that you could have access to. And if you decide you are, quote, playing Harlequins, there's no detachment for that. There's no bonus for that. All you do is decide that you're only going to draw your units from seven of those character sheets. And for the most part, they are not among the seven best. So currently, I think that if you are playing mono Harlequins, you're just kind of playing 40K on hard mode. And that's okay. Like back in eighth edition, if, when if you weren't doing Flying Circus, uh, Eldar really stank. Lots of us played Eldar on hard mode for years, but that doesn't make it any more palatable. It, it doesn't. It doesn't make it okay. I'm I'm sorry, Mono Harlequin players. I, I'm hoping that when we get our codex, they're going to sort you out, and there's going to be some sort of detachment with crazy bonuses if every unit in your army has the Harlequin's keyword. They. They obviously should do that, but that's not where we are now. Okay, so here is where we are now. Uh, I said Harlequins are a cool bag of tricks, and they are. Uh, they, they, so they basically do two things for your army. One, they are the thing that lets you force enemy units to take battle shock tests, which is really good. I think a lot of people are underestimating just how important Battleshock is going to be in this edition, and I'll say it again when I talk about the units that do it, but uh, there's a huge advantage to forcing your opponent to take Battleshock tests in phases other than the command phase because it means they can't use insane bravery. So there's just no way to auto-pass the types of tests that are triggered by your Harlequin models. And the other thing that Harlequins do uh, better than most craft world's models is that they that they skirmish uh they have the four up invuln which makes them a little bit tougher and they're sort of like when we look at the troops data card initially it doesn't look great to be fair i don't think it's quite as good as it ought to be but uh if you're running a single unit of troops and it's tripped out in the right way with the right buffs it it can be really powerful and then be this like four up invuln skirmishy unit that's in your opponent's face and that is relatively efficiently pointed but I definitely think that Harlequins are designed to be not more than 500 points of your army, not not a not a mono faction. Okay, let's let's jump in. We're gonna uh, work our way chronologically through the Harlequin data cards as they appear in the Codex, and then we'll do Unari, and then we'll do Corsairs. Uh, and so we're starting with the Death Jester. I think that the Death Jester is the single best Harlequin model in the Codex. I, I think it borders on being an auto-include, I think it's really strong. So uh, here's, here's, how he, here's how he works. He, he doesn't have the most amazing stat line. He moves eight. He's only toughness three. He's only got four wounds. He's got the four up in Vuln, one objective control, but he has the lone operative keyword. And the lone operative keyword is so good in this edition. And that's the keyword that means that if, a, if an enemy unit is outside of 12 inches, it simply cannot target him. 
so loan operatives are functionally immune to indirect fire, to any fire. Uh, so he can just stand out in the open in your deployment zone and blast away at the enemy. Uh, and he's got a really good shooting power and a very powerful pair of abilities. So uh, the the uh, Shrieker cannon is 24 inches, three attacks, ballistic skill two, like that, strength six, minus one AP, flat two damage, and devastating wounds. So six is to wound. We'll simply push those two through as mortal wounds. But that's not all. He has the cruel amusement ability in your shooting phase. Uh, you can pick one model from your army that has this ability. So if you have multiple death, death jesters, only one of them per turn is doing cruel amusement, which I think is the reason to only have one. You could take more, but I, I think one is the number. Uh, and you can either give the death jester ignores cover, precision, or sustained hits three. Now, I think the move here is sustained hits three. And furthermore, I think for 15 points, you give the death jester fate's messenger, which is the enhancement that lets you sit, set a hit roll, roll a wound roll, or... Uh, saving through a roll to a six after you've made the roll, which is also really cool. And so here's what this means. This guy's got three attacks. He hits on twos. Uh, so you could just roll all three dice. You have a 50% chance of getting a six. And then you just use Fate's Messenger to set another one to a six. And if so if you end up with two sixes, that's going to be eight hits because each of them is going to do an additional three hits on top of maybe the other one hit two. Uh, or you could use a single fate die and set one to a six before you roll, roll two, and then if you miss with one of them, you set that one to a six, and it pretty much guarantees you nine hits uh, at pretty pretty decent stats, right? Strength six, minus one, flat two, um, and your opponent just can't shoot back at him. In, in the, obviously, your other option uh, if there's a character that really needs to die and Illic and your rangers need just a little extra help, it's got two wounds left or whatever, instead you could use Fate's Messenger to uh, trigger devastating wounds and push flat two damage through him in Volna's Mortals. So the, the Death Jester is only 70 points, and for 85 you can give him that enhancement and, and just make him terrifying. And he's, he's probably going to he's gonna be long-lived, right? He's, he's going to be able to do this maybe every turn of the game certainly for the first several turns of the game it's just a it's just a really good tool and in combination with uh illic and those rangers again it just gives you this like backline firing solution of models that you do not even need to hide that are just adding to the fire that you can throw down range with your d cannons that can fire from out of line of sight and your fire prisms which can uh you know, Phantasm out of line of sight or Fire and Fade out of line of sight and have all of them fire. It just gives you this crazy volume of fire uh, without having to expose yourself. So I think the Death Jester is really good. I think it's the, definitely the standout Harlequin pick. He can shoot from inside the open-topped Harlequin transport also. Uh, I, I'm not crazy about that. Uh, it's not a bad idea to move him around to get line of sight on stuff, but because he has lone operative, like I, he doesn't really need the protection of the transport. Oh, and I think maybe units don't use abilities when they're in transports now. I think that's a thing in 10th edition, so that would be yet another, if I'm right about that, yet another reason not to do it. There are people talking about running three of these things. I think, uh, I don't think the points make sense there relative to the other stuff that you can get, but I think one verges on being an auto-include. Okay, Sky Weavers is next chronologically in the Codex. Uh, this is a 95-point bike unit with two models, or you can double the points and, and double it to four models. Uh, it moves 14 inches, toughness four, three wounds, four up in Vuln, so a bit like in the last edition before the nerf. Uh, it comes with either a Shuriken Cannon or a Skyweaver uh, Haywire Cannon. We know what the Shuriken Cannon does. The uh, Haywire Cannon is anti-vehicle four up, devastating wounds, two attacks, Ballistic skill three, strength three, doesn't matter because you're targeting vehicles. Minus one AP, flat three damage. I guess the strength does matter because with flat three damage, you could potentially also use it to pop some heavy infantry if you used faith dice to auto wound on sixes. But what really makes the, the, that combo good on the, the Sky Weaver Haywire Cannon is the combination of anti-vehicle and devastating wounds. 
because devastating wounds doesn't cue off a six, it cues off a critical wound and anti-vehicle means that on a four or better, it counts as a critical wound. So it means you can, any four up to wound, will just do mortal wounds of threes to vehicles. Now it's only two shots per bike. Uh, you could use fate dice to, pull the, to push those through. This is a pretty points efficient anti-vehicle combo. It's definitely, put it this way, it's better than Shining Spears. Shining Spears are way overcosted relative to other stuff in the Codex. And if you want a fast bike unit that flies around that's dangerous to light infantry, reasonably dangerous to some heavy infantry maybe, and also good against vehicles, uh, the Skyweavers can do that for you. And they, they're cheap enough that they can sort of skirmish while they're doing it and have a little bit of durability with that invuln save. And again, it's nice to be able to use your, your uh, fate dice rolls that are not sixes, your fours, to both trigger uh, mortal wounds and also to save. Given how expensive these things are, I'm not crazy about just putting the shirking cannon on there. I think that that was a good pick potentially in the last edition when it made a difference to the points. I don't, I don't think you want to do that now. Uh, you can then have either the star bolas or the zephyr glaive uh i really i like the glaive it's four attacks three up weapon skill strength five um minus one ap flat two damage and that suddenly so you, you've got your have eight attacks coming in right with a uh, good anti-infantry profile and so now with the, the haywire cannon on there you're good against light infantry you're good against heavy infantry uh you're good against vehicles it becomes a good answer to pretty much anything that's not like a big tough monster if you just really like the way the star bolas look as i do they're not bad either it's d3 attacks uh hitting on threes at strength seven minus two flat two also so again it's an anti-infantry profile I, the zephyr glaive is a slightly better anti-infantry profile i think i think because it's uh guaranteed four attacks per bike instead of d3 attacks per bike but there but the star bowl is not far behind and if if that's what you've got modeled on there don't worry about it it's still solid also it has the smoke keyword so you can spend uh you can spend a cp to make it minus one to hit although i guess you could do that anyway with lightning fast but it would enable you to use lightning fast elsewhere it's a good unit the, bi the biggest challenge that this unit is going to face is that there is so much good stuff in the codex that kills vehicles and heavy infantry very efficiently that it might just get nudged out in terms of utility but it is not a it is not a bad unit and if you are thematically committed to running harlequins it's it's good it's cheap enough to trade uh it's certainly good enough to skirmish and screen for its points okay the solitaire uh i am almost very excited about the solitaire Almost. I think at 115 points, he's just a little expensive relative to other options we have that do the things that he does well. So the, the Solitaire is a character assassin. Uh, that, that's, that's what he does. He's a super fast foot character assassin. So he has a 12-inch move, and he has the standard elf character stat line, it seems. He's got toughness three, three wounds. He's got the four-up in Vuln. Uh, he has nine attacks though with precision hitting on two strength six minus two flat two with precision so most characters in the game he's really gonna mess up uh and once per battle he can make a blitz move in which you add 2d6 to his movement it still counts as a normal move and so he's moving 12 inches plus 2d6 and then you're, you're also and then he's charging and you're adding three to his attack characteristic so he's attacking 12 times and he can also uh advance and charge if he wants to do that so and he has lone operative that's important too so you, you can keep the solitaire safe even if he's not necessarily in a vehicle and he can run in and smack something and maybe trade up uh he also if there are no good character targets he could wipe out a small squad of marines probably if he uses that blitz right because he's going to be hitting on twos wounding on threes they're going to be saving on five up and every failed save is going to be a dead marine incidentally if he pops out of a falcon because you can now put harlequins in falcons and wave serpents he then re-rolls all of his failed wounds which would also be good 
Oh, and it's a three up and vulnerable save. There are not a whole lot of three up and vulnerable saves in, in the game. And so that's really good too. I mean, if your opponent targets with him with something that uh, is pretty decent, this flat three damage, you only seem to fail one and he's dead, dead. But, uh, but he also has fights first. So the other thing that he can do, if he's like running with other stuff in your midfield, staying out of line of sight, I mentioned this in another video, he's also like an insurance policy until you're ready to use him. So if something charges through a, a ruin and charges something of yours, he can heroically intervene. And because def the defending player in 10th edition in always activates first in both for units that have priority that are fighting first and for units that started the round engaged, the defending player activates first, which means if you have a, a, a unit with fights first and it gets charged by your opponent on your opponent's turn, that unit will get to fight first. So he's a great deterrent. He's a great insurance policy at 115 points. And because he's small base, he's like easy to hide, easy to run with something else. Uh, he's good. The only reason that I'm not very excited about the Solitaire is between the Death Jester and uh, Illic Night Spear and the Rangers, we have so much good like anti-character play in the midboard that I don't think because the Harlequins no longer have the flip belt, he one thing he cannot do is just like jump over enemy models to get to the unit that he really wants to get to. I, I don't necessarily think that he's gonna be doing a job that uh that needs to be done if you're playing mono harlequins i mean he's going to be one of the good things in your list and also i can absolutely see down the road discovering that you you need him because of because of that ability to provide an insurance policy against uh enemy infantry charging through ruins at you but with those other units at 115 points if you were like 85 i'd be all in uh at 115 points i think he's a solid pick but not Maybe not as good as he would be if he were a unit available to an another army. Like I think if you just moved the solitaire, I think there are all sorts of armies that would love to have the solitaire. Uh, I just think we have a lot of other stuff that does that. So I'm going to say very good, not quite an auto include, but but definitely very good. Okay, the Star Weaver, the Harlequin transport. It's down to 80 points, which is cool. Uh, that's good. It it doesn't. It, it's not a. It's I mean it's a transport. It's not a combat unit. Uh, it has a couple of shuriken cannons, which is solid. I like the sustained hits on shuriken cannons. And as a 14-inch move, T6, six wound, four up and vulnerable save, double shuriken cannon model uh, that theoretically could be a cheap trading piece or something. Just as that, it's not you know it's not bad. But what it really does for you, it has a firing deck, so it's open top, so embarked harlequins can shoot. Now I already talked about why I don't think it's a. I'm not really tempted to throw death jesters in there, and the the rules on what there are no more fusion boats. This is back in ninth edition they uh, altered the rules for harlequins, so you couldn't just take a whole bunch of fusion pistols. We haven't talked about troops yet, but that is that rule is still in play. So the firing deck is not like. It matters, but it's not super important. Really what the Star Weaver does for you is uh, it's got this rapid embarkation rule, which lets, at the end of the fight phase, a Harlequin's in infantry unit wholly within six inches jump back into the transport. So you can have five, a Harlequin troop with five models led by a troop master, jump out of a Star Weaver, charge some, move, right? Make the move to position for the charge. Then you move the Star Weaver, because if they just jump out of the Star Weaver, they then can't charge. So they jump out of the Star Weaver three inches from the base. They move towards the enemy. They get within charge range. You put the Star Weaver such that it will be wholly within six inches of the Harlequins when they complete their charge. They complete their charge. They fight. At the end of the fight phase, they get back into it, and then theoretically, they're ready to, you know, they're ready to go again. They have a little bit extra protection. They can go somewhere. It's not bad. And it's really nice with the Harlequin's models that you can, again, you can use your fate dice to just trigger their invuln save on a four up. Uh, but I think the fact that you can also put Harlequins and Falcons and Wave Serpents now does make it a, a little more touch and go whether or not uh, this is the play. Oh, I skipped the Shadow Seer. Sorry. Uh, yeah, let's, the Shadow Seer. So the Shadow Seer is a Harlequin leader character that can join uh, a troop, we assume. And. It has Twilight Pathways, so Harlequins no longer can advance and charge natively. 
they don't have minus one to hit natively. He gives uh, your Harlequin unit that he joins stealth, so they become minus one to hit, and he gives them advance and charge, and they can reroll their advance rolls, which is good. He is 60 points, and a unit of a typical Harlequin troop is going to be 75. So it, it takes the cost of the whole package uh, to 140, which in my opinion is maybe a little bit too much, uh, especially when you could just use Fate Dice to guarantee that your Harlequins could get a decent charge off. The ability to advance and charge is, is good. It would be worth it to me to consider including this guy if Harlequins had an objective control value of two. They don't, we're not there yet to, to the troops. I do not know why they don't. It seems obvious to me that they should. And if you could like move one unit of them really far and strip an objective off somebody, well then they would be doing something obviously very different from what Banshees do. Uh, it would be worth the, the unit that's now more expensive than a Fire Prism. But as it stands, I think the Shadow, I, I struggle to see exactly why we would take this instead of just a unit of banshees that can advance and charge natively and i yeah and is and is has a four up in volman in close combat okay uh the, the bread and butter harlequin troop maybe i just should have started with these guys because they are the bread and butter unit so uh they are they are looking they've been roughed up they've been roughed up since the last edition in 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 the past harlequins have been fragile expensive uh, hard hitting, and now they are fragile, <laughs> not as expensive as they were, but also in order to get the hard hits in, you have to use them, I think, in a very particular way. And I'm, I think you can probably only include one pretty efficient troop in your list, uh, may, maybe two, maybe two for, for reasons. So they, they move eight inches, they have the four up in Vuln, they're T3. Uh, I mentioned already they've lost the flip belt. They, they, they're they're special Harlequin weapons, right? They're free now, but they only do one damage now. So you could, you can either give them the Harlequin's blade, which gives you five attacks but is strength three with no AP, so you don't do that. Or you can give them the Harlequin special weapons. You do do that. That's uh, four attacks, three up weapon skill, strength four minus one flat one. Pretty unimpressive it's a it's a shuriken catapult it's, it's basically two shuriken catapults in, in close combat however they have this special rule harlequin assault each time this unit makes a charge move until the end of turn each time a model in this unit makes a melee attack add one to the wound roll plus one to the wound wound roll is actually really really good because it means that they're they're even wounding stuff that's like toughness 14 on five up and if you jump them out of a falcon, remember how the falcon works? If you jump them out of a falcon, you can give them uh, rerolls to wound. And if you're wounding on fives and rerolling, that's actually a little bit better than a 50% chance to wound. So they could, this one unit of Harlequins jumping out of a falcon potentially could be wounding the, the toughest models in, in the game on the equivalent of slightly better than a four up with a boatload of attacks. So in a sense, a bunch of Harlequins in a falcon that uh, is position is essentially positioned to answer any threat that comes uh, into the midfield, or potentially to um, play into your opponent's backfield closer to the late game when you need to like run through walls and root out the stuff that's that's back there. Uh, could be a good answer to like I don't know, desolation marines. Uh, the 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 issue is once you put it in the Falcon, the whole package starts to become pretty expensive. And again, this, we have other stuff in the codex that's just so good uh, that it might be a little bit hard to choose this. But that one squad of Harlequins, come, if, if they do have those rerolls to wound, uh, they do pretty well. And you can give in, in a unit of 10 or less, uh, you can give one of them a, either a fusion pistol or a neuro disruptor. You give them a fusion pistol. The, uh, squad leader has a Aldari blade, which is a little bit better, right? Uh, slightly better AP and, and one extra attack. I'm sorry, Eldari power sword. And for 55 points, you can attach a troop master uh, to the unit, which is a little bit more, a little bit more affordable than that shadow seer. And what the, the troop master does for you, he has choreographer of war, so he gives the whole unit devastating wounds. 
Uh, and if you are if you're coming out of a falcon and re-rolling wounds and you have plus one to wound, that doesn't help you trigger devastating wounds. But just the sheer the sheer weight of dice, right? If they're putting out like 25, 26 dice, you can definitely push through some devastating wounds. And the uh, Farseer also lets you use any fate die once per turn as a six for a wound roll, a hit roll, or a saving throw. Uh, that's good. And you can give him a fusion pistol that's uh, D3 damage but melt a two. So when it's up close, it's essentially, it's doing D3 plus two. I think that that build makes Harlequins feel like Harlequins. It makes them feel really dangerous. You have this uh, four up invulned, fragile, potentially fast moving tool. Fast moving if you use fate dice. But you, this is, you know, that's, it's one, it's one unit of Harlequins that you're doing this with. And, and I don't know if it necessarily compares favorably to other stuff in the book, but I don't think it's bad. Uh, I think ultimately their their melee is going to, with the right set of buffs, be a bit better than the Banshee melee. And if they were also objective control too, I'd say yeah, totally makes sense to have a unit of these guys. As it is, I think it's I think it's kind of touch and go. If you if you if you love the notion of a Harlequin patrol in your list, I think uh, the players are are fine. I think they can do some work for you, but I I, I don't think you're going to need a bunch of them. Sorry, mono Harlequin players. I really I really do feel for you. Okay, the void the void weaver. Uh, the void weaver is interesting. It's it's a hundred points, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Brent, don't even talk about it for another twenty points or so. You could you could have a fire prism. Why would you take a void weaver? Well, there there is a reason. Like the death jester, uh, the void weaver is a tool for forcing people to take battle shock tests in the shooting phase when they cannot just use. Uh, the two-point stratagem and saying bravery to beat the battle shock test. So it's a way of potentially stripping all objective control from enemy units, preventing them from using stratagems. I think it's, you can't force them to fail the test, so it's not like a totally reliable tool, but being able to throw out a bunch of battle shock tests, like if, if you had one of these things in a death jester, uh, being able to throw out a bunch of battle shock tests that are unbeatable over the course of a game, if you're doing this, I think you really can mess with your opponent's plans. Uh, so the Void Weaver has a 14-inch move. It's toughness six. It's six wounds. It's that Harlequin bike chassis. Uh, it has the Prismatic Cannon, which has a pulse profile and a focused lance profile. The pulse profile has, they're both 36 inches. It has blast, 2d6 attacks, three up ballistic skill, strength four, no AP, one damage. It's for picking up light infantry, but 2d6 blast is, that's a lot of attacks. And then the focused lance is only two attacks, strength 12, minus three AP, flat four damage. Not bad, not bad. Uh, flat four is kind of, strength 12, flat four is kind of interesting. It's, you know, it's with two attacks, it's good into anything. It's really good at killing heavy infantry. It can definitely ding a tank for four uh, with two shots. Um, and it's got strands of fate. So it's, you know, rerolling one hit roll, rerolling one wound roll. But it also has this devastating assault ability. In your shooting phase, after this model has shot, select one enemy unit hit by one or more of those attacks, the enemy unit must take a battle shock test. Now, I think for the death jester, you actually have to remove a model, right? Whereas this thing just guarantees it. So uh, you have these two, I mentioned at the beginning, Harlequins, they, they skirmish in interesting ways and uh, they, they force opponents to take battle shock tests. I, I think the, the issue the Void Weaver faces, I, I don't think it's a problem that the fire prism, because the fire prism is a killer. This is like a, an interesting tool. It's also a bit more durable than the prism at a four up. Um, I, I think the problem right now is that because of how fate dice work with devastating wounds, anything that you might really need, battle shock is like a, well, I'm not gonna be able to kill it. So I think I'll battle shock it. But we have such good shooting right now with the devastating wounds ability that uh, anything that really has to die that's just out in the open, or maybe not even out in the open because of towering and D cannons, we probably can kill, uh, but I, I think if there is some kind of nerf to the ability to just dump tons of mortal wounds every round on, on your opponent, which I think is not unlikely, I think that uh, suddenly the Void Weaver is going to look a lot more appealing. I don't think it's bad now. I th again, I think most of us are underestimating just how much Battleshock is going to matter. I already like this thing as a tool. 
I think if the index gets tinkered with at some point, we might find ourselves really liking them as tools. So for me, this is kind of like a standby unit with some really interesting potential in terms of the ability to manipulate uh, your opponents, what your opponent can do. Okay, so, so those are the Harlequin units. Uh, interesting toolbox, some, some good stuff there for Craft Worlds players splashing in Harlequins. Uh, not great news for mono Harlequins. Okay, Yanari. Yanari have become like Harlequins, sort of a Craft World extension. If you are running Eldari, there is nothing to stop you from running any of the Yanari characters in your list. Uh, they have Strands of Fate, they do the, they do the normal Craft Worlds things. But if you make Yvrain your Warlord, you then have a Yanari list, and that changes the rules such that you can no longer use Phoenix Lords of the Avatar of Cain, but you can, or uh, Corsairs, weirdly, but you do have access to like two thirds of the Drukhari models. I am not going to touch that uh, build. One of the reasons, we're gonna start with Yvrain talking about Yanari. One of the reasons to consider running her is so that you can make her your Warlord and do that. Uh, at some future point, I will invite a Yanari expert onto the channel to specifically talk about how you might run a true Yanari list that incorporates Drakari models. For now, I'm just going to talk about running her in a, in a Craft Worlds lists and, and how that might work. Uh, she's good. Also, all three Yanari models are, can we just acknowledge aesthetically, they're fabulous. They're probably some of the best models in 40K, definitely some of the nicest elf models. Uh, my Yvrain is, is painted such that the her cat looks like the Lie Cat. If you know who the Lie Cat is, I have special respect for you. Okay, so if, if Yvrain is not becoming your warlord so that you can access Drakari and uh, give up things like Jane Zar and Corsairs and all the people that she runs around with in the lore, so that doesn't really make sense, but if she's not going to be your warlord, really what she is is a combat character. She's 100 points, and she's a pretty good combat character. Uh, we have a lot of good combat characters, though, so I don't know if she makes the cut. Weirdly, she can deep strike, and the reason that this is weird is that the way the deep strike rules are written and in order to be able to deep strike all of the models in the unit have to have it so you can only deep strike Yvrain if you're just sending her in alone without lone operative which is actually not necessarily a terrible idea but maybe not a good idea uh because she's she's got some cool leader powers uh but she's a combat character so her her weapon really is is the storm of whispers it was a yanari psychic attack in the, in the last edition or yanari psychic power uh the storm of whispers is 12 inch range d6 plus three attacks hits on twos only strength two but that doesn't matter minus two ap only one damage but it's anti-infantry two plus devastating wounds which means uh because I, as I said before, devastating wounds cues off critical hits, and anti-infantry means that on twos to wound, it just does devastating wounds. That means that all of your two ups just do mortal wounds to infantry. And she's hitting on twos, right? And there are some reroll or detachment rerolls there. So you're basically just putting out D6 plus three dice of two up mortal wounds against infantry with some rerolls which is pretty powerful that's going to blow a big hole in your opponent's infantry and then she's got a pretty good melee weapon she can charge follow up charge uh five attacks uh, weapon skill two up strength four but devastating wounds again minus three ap flat two uh that's cool she's got a four up invuln save so she she really hits hard i mean i i don't think you want to put i was I don't think you want to send her in alone. She's exactly the same cost as a unit of warp spiders. So you could have some warp spiders come in and uh, basically auto hit with around 21 attacks. They wouldn't then do devastating wounds. Or you could bring your brain in. Um, it's something at least to think about as an option. It's kind of a fun idea. Uh, but, if you, but if you have her lead a unit, she gives the whole unit a five up feel no pain. And while she's leading the unit in your command phase, you roll a d6, and on a 2 plus d3, destroyed bodyguard models are returned. Now, she can lead uh, Corsair, Void Scarred Reavers, Guardian Defenders, Kabbalate Warriors, Storm Guardians, a troop of Harlequins, or Witches. So you could stick her into a troop of Harlequins with 11 other Harlequins, at which point they would all have 
a four up invulnerable save, a five up feel no pain, she's got a pretty freaking cool uh, combat profile and they could potentially like jump out of a wave serpent with her or or not and she could be bringing back d3 of them per turn now if you get if you were to get that unit into some place on the field where your opponent didn't have a lot of resources to deal with it if you were to use it as like a late game uh creep and sweep it could potentially really be a good tool is it worth the points that it would cost no probably not if she gave deep strike to the whole squad if she could come in with her bodyguard unit and uh, do her Storm of Whispers and charge with the Bodyguard unit and use a Fate Die, then I'd say absolutely, definitely. That's really cool. Uh, if you're going to take her, I think she either runs with uh, a big Harlequin troop or possibly uh, Corsairs, which we'll talk about in a moment. She's good enough that if you want to use the model, you can use her, but she's, she definitely, d definitely is not where I would go first in, in a competitive build. Okay, the Vizark, uh, Yvrain's sidekick he uh I, I used to at some point i made the joke that i like to imagine that the vizark is actually just casey jones from the ninja turtles back in the day uh there's something i think the model's really cool but there's also something that i found just i find just like slightly silly about it it has like a sigmar vibe that i don't know i don't know i, I find him a little funny the vizark also is a leader also a combat character and is allowed to attach to the same squad that yvrain attaches to and he gives the whole squad fight first so potentially you could have yvrain and the vizark running with uh 10 pretty tripped out harlequins that now also fight first he has uh he's got a two up save which is cool um he moves eight he's got five wounds he's toughness three like elves are with the four up involved um his melee weapon has precision so he can be a character assassin he has five attacks two up weapon skill strength five minus four ap is really good flat two damage uh and he also you choose each round whether he, he's going to have sustained hits too that's good devastating wounds that's pretty good lethal hits uh sure if if you're putting up against something if you're putting them up against something really tough and you need to be able to auto wound uh pretty good i think because there's nothing durable for him to attach to truly durable and because he's not very quick on his own i feel like he's a little over costed at 90 points but again it like if you were to if you were to put him in a in a unit of harlequins alongside yvrain that now has four up invulns and a five up feel no pain and they fight first and you get the added damage output from both yvrain and this guy like that's a beat stick it's just a it's just a fragile beat stick is the problem especially for the points especially given what else you can get in this codex index excuse me let me put it this way i feel like really skilled players who know how to move position hold stuff back do target priority uh can probably use yvrain and the vizark really well in everything up to pretty high level play in pretty high level play uh i'm gonna have to we're, we're gonna need a an actual yanari expert to weigh in on whether or not there's a a way to really make it work because both these characters seem pretty solidly b-list to me but not bad not bad uh, the Yincarn. The Yincarn, on the other hand, is is straight up good. Uh, so, the Yincarn has is a is a monster. It's also the nicest, probably elf model, just in terms of the sophistication of the sculpt. But uh, ten inch move, toughness ten, two up save. Thank goodness for that two up save. Twelve wounds, three objective control, and uh, most importantly, the Yincarn has retained inevitable death and it's actually gotten better so once per phase if this model is on the battlefield when another unit is destroyed after removing the last model in that unit you can remove this model from the battlefield and set it up as close as possible to where the destroyed model was and not within an engagement range of the enemy so you couldn't let la there were all sorts of restrictions on this in the last edition what this means is on turn one you can shoot something in your opponent's backfield with uh, your Wraith cannons with Towering or your D cannons, kill it, have the Incarn appear there next to your opponent's other stuff, and in that same turn, make a charge move and just be on your opponent. Uh, that's one way to play it. And then your opponent spends the first turn trying to kill this T10, 2-up, 4-up, 
to a save four up invuln monster that still has all incoming damage in their backfield that's messing with them while like your wraith knight and your fire prisms and everything else is taking the midfield and running riot um so that's one way to do it. The other way would be to hold the Yin Karn back until you thinned out was what was in your opponent's backfield, and your opponent really just might not be able to deal with it. It's also a really good tool. It, it's under 300 points, too. It's, it's 270. Uh, it's also a really good tool for, uh, for scoring, for uh, secondaries that require you to be in particular places on the table or take particular objectives off of an opponent or something, because you can, of course, shoot the unit off your opponent's home objective that's holding it and have the Yin Karn appear there, uh, that's crushing, you know? I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways to play with this. I will say that the actual damage output of the Yin Karn, although it is still very good, it it doesn't compare to the Avatar of Cain. So it, it's ranged attack. It has a, it's really a melee monster, but it, it has a ranged attack that's pretty decent. 12-inch uh, range torrent so it's a flamer it ignores cover it automatically hits uh d6 plus three attack strength seven minus one ap d3 damage that's pretty solid it's going to be really good against infantry uh both light and heavy infantry it'll do pretty well and then for its melee profile it has the strike version and the sweep version the strike version is five attacks hits on twos strength 12 minus four ap d6 plus one damage that's good right uh it's it's not going to kill a knight but it just about any medium-sized tank, medium-sized monster, infantry, uh, heavy infantry unit, it's gonna just absolutely mess up hard. And then the uh, sweep attack, 10 attacks, hitting on two, strength six, minus four AP, one damage in combination with the flamer attack, like you can wipe uh, infantry. Most of the units in the game, between the shooting and the melee, it, it probably can pick up in a turn. Not the stuff that's, that's really tough. It's not gonna like delete a wraith knight if you're in a, in a mirror match but it, but it does it does real work so there's there's a there are a lot of tricks with this it's a useful tool and i think most players are either going to use it to be uh to, to give themselves breathing room on turn one to just put all this pressure on the opponent or i think probably the better use is like a mid to late game it takes real patience to hold something like this back but like a mid to late game uh sort of checkmate unit in on in your opponent's backfielder on your opponent's half of the table it's very good but also we have lots of stuff in this in this index that is very good uh but it, it is yet another tool to to think about and i like stuff with cool movement shenanigans and and tricks and with the loss of uh customizable psychic powers and a billion stratagems eldar we, we have all armies all armies have fewer tricks so i i like capitalizing on the very elf uh ones that we have and i think this i think this is one of those i'm definitely going to be uh trying to figure out how to get the most of my yinkarn in competitive play and maybe also some casual games too because i think that this is one of those models that is viable for competitive play and also you're not you're not being a jerk if you bring it to a casual game especially if you left home you know your your wraith knight and your uh d cannons and whatnot all right uh corsair void reavers uh, Corsair Void Reavers are a 70-point battle line unit with objective control to, uh, they're fragile, but they have really good melee assault, and they have a scout move of seven. So presumably the notion is that you send the riffraff out in front of your, uh, your Eldar army, the, the pathless pirates, to, to soak up the damage and perform the initial objective assaults. If you're theoretically there for, like, you, you, you know, you move forward, you keep them out of line of sight, uh, behind terrain so that they're not clogging up it's hard to, to fit everything in your deployment zone on turn one so the ability to make a scout move right to put them behind something in the midfield can be good and then either your opponent's infiltrator units or if your opponent gets first turn and moves on to objectives like you can run at them screaming with your pirates uh at 70 points using void reavers as objective stripping chaff is it's not bad uh we we have so much so much good stuff in the codex i am having trouble fitting them into lists but but they're they're good they have a they have a good a good melee profile so uh each of them comes default with a shuriken pistol and an eldari power sword and that's nice because it has ap right they're way better than storm guardians 
Uh, each of them has two attacks, strength four, minus two AP, one damage, but even in a unit of five, you can give one of them either a shredder or a blaster. You should give them the blaster. It has an 18 inch range, hits on three, strength eight, minus four AP, D6 plus one damage. Uh, you cannot, however, automatically do seven wounds because they, they, they are Eldari, but they do not have strands of fate. They do not have strands of fate. Uh, the squad leader can have a neuro disruptor. So that's cool. It's anti-infantry. So it, it's one shot, but it's going to, it's going to wound infantry more or less automatically. Um, they're good. Uh... They are, I don't think you want the squad of 10. If you run 10 of them, you get to give one of them a Wraith Cannon, and that's awesome. And I love looking at the Wraith Cannon and the squad. Uh, but if making this unit suddenly like dangerous to monsters and vehicles, but cost more than a Fire Prism is kind of funny. Um, so, so don't do that. It's, a, it's an MSU, it's an MSU like Chaff Assault unit. And because you can run them in small squads, they're cheaper than either Guardian Defenders or Storm Guardians. Also, the uh, squad leader comes with a, a four-up Invuln Mist Shield that it gets for free, and that slightly offsets the not durable nature of them, but not much. I think I personally like Rangers better at 55 points as like a screening and uh, early game unit. But but they are but they're cheap enough that you could include some. Okay, Void Scarred, the elite. Uh, Corsairs. This is probably the most complicated data card in the entire uh, index, just because they're so customizable. But here's here's the here's the simple version. You're either running five, in which case you are running four regular Void Scarred, and one Felark, uh, who can you know take a. It's basically the same loadout options that we we just talked about. Uh, and they're just a, they're just a more elite version. They have less objective control, but they do more damage. Their Eldari power swords have three attacks instead of two, and and there's that. Uh, but they also have piratical raiders at the start of the battle, and they also scout seven inches. At the start of the battle, select one unit from your opponent's army. Each time a model in this unit makes an attack that targets that unit, that attack has the lethal hits and precision abilities, so they can commit themselves to either like hunting down an enemy character in a particular unit, uh, especially if that character is like forward of the army, or um, potentially just like ignore the precision thing. And there, there's, you know, what they're going to attack on turn one, so you get lethal hits against it, and that's pretty good. It's another twenty points. They hit a little bit harder. However, if you take it all the way to hundred and eighty, now you get all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, you, you can add the other specialty Corsairs in. You get uh, a Shade Runner, and you get a Soul Weaver, and you get a Way Seeker. Um, and you might be out there thinking, Brent, why can't... It doesn't say I can't include those things in the squad of five, but it does, dear listener, because the squad is one Voidscard Felark and four to nine Corsair Voidscard, and you have an option of either running five or ten models in the squad. So you are required to have four regular Void Scarred and a Felark. So you can only take the other specialists if they're ten models in the squad, at which point there's no reason not to swap three of your Void Scarred for the specialists. And all, all the specialists do is they give you access to different weapons. They don't have, like, different profiles. They all have the same profile. Uh, the... So the special here's what the specialists do. The uh, the melee specialist has the Hektari blades. Um, they're twin linked, so it's four attacks. They're only strength three, but you reroll the wounds. Uh, there's an a, an anti infantry witch staff in there. That's a, a melee weapon. That does D three like the like the warlock weapons. Uh, there is the um, Falchu. Ranged weapons equipped by models in the Bearers unit have the Ignore's cover ability, so they can do that. And you have the guy with the Channeler Stones the first time you fail a save, uh, or once per turn. Oh, no, it is, it is the first time. But the first time you fail a save, you reduce the damage characteristic to zero. Um, these guys are the combat version of this squad. It's, like, really fun and crunchy and so cool for casual play uh, with all these rules and all this stuff to keep track of, and it does not even begin to amount to making the squad worth the points relative 
to the other stuff in the index. 180 points for a squad of fragile, cool specialists that actually don't hit that much harder than a lot of your uh, other good infantry squads. Um, the points, the points don't make sense. I, I love the models. I have a bunch of these guys too, and p potentially you could run them with like Yvrain and the Vizark or something. But I, I really think that the uh, the invulnerable save that the Harlequins have in in combination with the five up feel no pain, I think I think that's a better candidate. Uh, so I don't I don't currently see a way to make the big pirate squad especially viable on competitive tables, but I am sure bringing mine to casual games because they are, they're some of the nicest elf models that there are. And they remain really good in boarding actions, so there's, there's that too. Okay, and to finish up, uh, I, oh, and I know that some of you were really hoping that I would have really smart stuff to say about Corsairs. Uh, I, I do think that the basic unit is absolutely usable. Um, it, you know, it's, it's cheap. It, it's our cheapest option for 2 OC reasonably good like melee assault trading um and i wish i could tell you that there was a way to make them like just a hands down one up in in competitive lists but i'm i'm currently not seeing it hopefully hopefully at some point that'll change okay and to finish up wind riders not because it makes any sense but simply because i forgot them in the last video when i did guardians and i was supposed to talk about guardians on bikes and i forgot so wind riders uh wind riders are 80 points for three and then you can also take them in sixes or nines you do the math uh th they have three loadout options but they really only have two loadout options because there's really no reason to take the shuriken catapults uh you can give them scatter lasers with a 36 inch range six attacks hitting on threes strength five on the wind rider bike no ap one damage uh or you can give them the shuriken cannon with sustained hits uh three attacks exploding sixes for sustained hits Strength six, minus one, flat two, and then they have swift demise. Each time a model in this unit, unit makes a ranged attack that targets the closest eligible target, reroll a hit roll of one. And if that target is on an objective marker, you can just reroll the hit roll. So it's good for clearing objective markers, and you also get your one reroll to wound uh, for the detachment power. Wind Riders are interesting because although they don't really, they don't, it doesn't say anything on the card, there is all of this like interesting stuff that you can do with them. Because they're so fast, for example, and I talked about some of this when I did that first video and I was talking about the characters you can attach to them. Because they're so fast, for example, uh, you can put them up on top of a ruin if, they're, if it's a five inch or, or more ruin to trigger plunging fire to give them all um, AP. So like if you were gonna give them scatter lasers, it would make sense to put them up on a ruin, you shoot something with like 54 scatter laser shots if it's a big squad and then you phantasm them out of line of sight before your opponent can shoot them and the scatter lasers the 54 scatter laser shots all are at minus one ap and a combo i really like if you shoot something first with uh some shroud runners to trigger that shroud runner ability within 12 inches now those 54 scatter laser shots have lethal hits so all your six is to hit uh auto wound and you're re-rolling ones if it's the closest unit even if it's pretty far away for the wind rider ability, or you could just throw guide on there and, and you know, you roll 54 dice, you set your sixes aside, you roll all of the remaining dice, you set the sixes aside, all of those auto wound, and then you get to try to wound. And if they're up on top of something, you have plunging fire. This is a way that you could put a bunch of wounds on something uh, like a knight. You're not gonna like kill a knight, but um, it would be the equivalent to shooting it with some, with a couple of really big and bad weapons. Uh, that's a solid combo. I, I don't know that it's necessarily worth the points the way things currently stand in the, in the codex. There's other cool stuff you can do. When you fire and fade with these guys, they get to make their full move, which wasn't true in the last edition. So that 14 inch move on fire and fade is really good. Uh, the smaller units of them, it's a perfectly good escort unit for like a Farseer Skyrunner. Although you can also just send the Farseer Skyrunner out on its own with a uh, Phoenix gem. And that really might be the better play. Uh, I do, I really like shuriken cannons. If they, if they take away our put mortal wounds on anything ability with, with uh, dice, which I think they probably will at some point, 
Um, I think shuriken cannons are really good in this edition, and three of these things or six of these things with shuriken cannons and sustained hits, you throw a guide on there. I think uh, because with guide, of course, you can you can fish also for more sustained hits. Mm -hmm. I think that um, that's a really powerful tool against like both light infantry and sort of mid-sized infantry, uh, and the ability to get around and clear objectives is pretty good. Wind riders, wind riders are solid. I don't think that they need the, uh, there's all sorts of things you can attach to them. I don't think that they need the Warlock leading them. I think it's, he doesn't, he allows them to ignore cover or makes them minus one to hit. Well, they're not actually durable with minus one to hit and ignores cover is good, but I only think it actually makes sense to do the, to spend the extra points on the Warlock to ignore cover if you are running the enormous squad that's like going to get up on a ruin because if you've got a if, if those scatter lasers all have minus one ap for plunging fire and they're also ignoring cover well now that's actually a that's actually a pretty scary tool and the small squad of wind riders with the shuriken cannons uh that's a, a reasonably cheap screening unit i would personally rather pay a little bit more and just get a war walker um or a viper pay a little bit less and get a viper but it's not bad I think that there are a lot of ways to play around with Wind Riders, and I, I think currently, although they may be being overshadowed by other things, depending on how things go in the coming weeks and months as the game gets fiddled with, uh, we, we, may, we may be coming up with really interesting ways to use Wind Riders. I do think that they, I do think that they have play. I don't think you, I don't think it's worth putting the Autark with them, uh, and they're a perfectly reasonable squad on their own. Okay, so that's. Oh no! I, you know what? The Webway Gate. Uh, everybody, maybe instead of talking about the Webway Gate, we should have a moment of silence for the Webway Gate. Except it wasn't, it wasn't good in the last edition, either. After the first five minutes of the edition, so maybe we don't need to have a moment of silence. The Webway Gate is cool. It's just, uh, it is, it is insanely. It does. It does nothing worth it. It's ridiculous. It's, uh, it's hysterically, hilariously overpriced and and does almost nothing. Uh, you, you can, for the problem with it is you can only put it in your deployment zone. It enables you to bring units in from reserves within six inches of the gate, even if it means it's within nine inches of enemy models. And there's a way to like give them cover. Uh, and it is 220 points. I have no idea how they arrived at that number. If this thing were 50 points, I, I probably wouldn't take it. Uh, 220 points. It, it seems like they arbitrarily decided to roll uh, 2d3, one for, and then like one for ones and one for tens, and then multiplied it by 10 while they all laughed uh, and, and had a beer in Bugman's. It, it seems like it's just been intentionally priced in an absolutely ludicrous way to make it something that you don't even think about in competitive games, but it's kind of there for depth and flavor uh, for casual narrative play. Or maybe it's like a mistake and you were meant to be able to put it not in your deployment zone, but even then 220 points is insane. So yeah, the, the, webway, the webway gate is uh, probably not going to show up in any of your lists anytime soon. Okay, now that's what I've got. That is the, that is the index review. It's the, it's the, it's the whole thing uh, in three parts. And I, th I thought I might be done for a few days while, while I could just, you know, focus on playing my own games of 10th edition. I've got, uh, got one tomorrow I'm excited about. But, um, but no, because they dropped Imperial Armor today, which means I have to be back in a couple of days to talk about that stuff. So I'll definitely do that. But this concludes the, uh, the index review. If you like this video, I hope you will click like. If you have anything to say, even if it's just to help out the algorithm, I hope you'll leave a comment below. If you've not subscribed, please subscribe. I'm really hoping to get to 10,000 subscribers in the first months of 10th edition. It would make me feel good about this content. Uh, if you want to join the Discord, you could become a patron. It's three bucks a month. Y you also get early access to content and you can download a lot of it like podcasts but the discord is great and uh you can talk to me and other people over there all right i'll be back again soon to uh talk about the imperial armor release and until then i hope that you are enjoying your early games of 10th edition and being treated with at least courtesy by opponents who are quite understandably and reasonably shuddering when you put a wraith knight on the table that's it I'll be back again soon. Take care. Bye.